Hello and welcome, my name is Mark Ferguson and I'm going to be presenting our work on player style clustering without game variables. In this work we look to develop techniques that can allow us to cluster play styles based on gameplay videos collected from players. We believe it's key to be able to cluster play styles for a number of reasons. First, it can allow us to evaluate the composition of a player base. This can allow us to extract whether any one play style is disproportionately used and this may hint at an unbalanced game mechanic that needs fixed. Additionally, we can look to generate AI agents with these known styles and these can be used in a number of applications. One such application would be to automate the testing of new game content using play styles that are known to exist in the player base. However, ultimately we believe this should be achieve achieved without use of game variables as it introduces a couple of main benefits. Firstly, it allows the use of additional data sources such as let plays videos that themselves don't record the game variables and hence at current can't be used with the current methods. Additionally, it's believed the choice of variables can have a heavy effect on the kind of play styles you cluster. Hence, by removing them to choose them, you can remove any un unintended bias. In order to test any evaluated methods, we have to choose a couple of game environments and generate some gameplays for each of them. Our first game was Black Smoke, and based on previous literature, we designed two play styles. The first was a runner that headed for the exit as quickly as possible. The second was more similar to a completionist who looked to break box and collect them on the route. The second environment we used was VizDoom. This is a first person shooter and in this case we define play styles based on two features. Firstly the player's weapon choice and secondly the player's movement within the map. Once we had these gameplay videos we had to transform them into representation space in order to cluster. In order to do this we decided to use a hybrid encoder called the STDIMV encoder. This shares elements from two previous parts of literature and here we'll break down what each of these are, how they work and what features they encourage the encoder to learn. Firstly, the VE section. In this case, you're given the current frame and it's compressed down to a representation. This is then slightly altered and it looks to try and recreate the original frame from this. By doing this, you encourage the encoder to learn very frame by frame information which is useful. However, it doesn't account for any information that's maintained across the whole sequence of frames. This is where the SD DIM part comes in. In this case, you're given both the current frame and the next frame, generate a set of both global and local features and look to maximize the mutual information between these. It has been shown in previous work that this encourages the encoder to learn more high-level information across the whole sequence. Ultimately, by combining both these architectures and optimising for both, we can encourage the encoder to learn both frame-by-frame -frame features as well as some high-level information. Once the encoder was trained, we were able to transform the sequence of frames into a sequence of representations and further transform this into a distance matrix using dynamic time warping. We can then evaluate how similar videos looked based on our knowledge of the ground truth. However, in this investigation it was found that playstyles that were deemed the same didn't always have a short direct distance between them. However, interestingly, in further investigation it was found when comparing how these points compared to other points in the data set, it was found the distance to these were often similar. Hence we looked to see if there's a way we could extract this indirect information in a way to evaluate how close two points truly were. In order to do this we plotted out the distance from these points to other reference points in the data set. The example here on the bottom left is taken from when we're comparing points with the same cluster. In this case, as we're expecting points to be a similar distance apart, any plotted point should appear on the y equals x line. Hence, if we calculate the trends line gradient, it should be close to 1. On the other hand, when we're looking at points from different clusters as shown in the centre graph, this is no longer the case and hence the gradient of the line should start to decrease. This means we can look at this gradient and use this as a value to determine and indirectly how similar two points are. Based on this, we could generate a set of initial graphs. This was done by taking each data point and joining it to its data point that has its highest gradient. Two examples of such initial graphs generating are shown on the right, which shows the common features you and saw. On the left hand side, we see a single high degree node of which all other data points branch out from, whereas on the right, we see two high degree nodes that are weakly linked. In this case, a decision had to be made in whether these two high degree nodes themselves were part of the same cluster or part of different clusters. In order to evaluate this, on the assumption both degrees, the high degree nodes had a degree higher than 3, we traced the path and to see if either edges were either too high or too low, and if they were, they will cut. After this was applied, we then looked to re-merge relevant subgraphs. This evaluated by looking at the average gradient between each of the subgraphs, and if this was above 0.8, the subgraphs were merged. This ended up with a final set of subgraphs which we defined as each of our clusters and based on this we could then label each of the data points within the data set. 
Using both these proposed methods, we're able to translate the gameplay into representation space and then cluster on this. So now let's look at some results. Firstly, let's consider our black smoke environment. In this case, our game variables can actually capture the playstyles that exist, and hence, no matter how high the noise, we still get perfect clusters. And this is shown by an AMI score on the graphs of 1. We then compared this against different encoding setups, including both the hybrid itself, as well as the separate elements of this. As can be seen, on the low noise datasets, both the encoding methods seem to perform reasonably well. However, when you start increasing the noise, you do seem to see a reduced reduction in the quality of the performance. Next, we then looked at our VizDoom dataset. Our initial experiments focused purely on gameplay styles separated based on the player's weapon choice. This meant that the game variables themselves accurately encapsulated these, and hence, in this case, we still got good performance when clustering on game variables. We then compared this to how an encoder setup has worked. On general, they seemed to perform reasonably well, but it was found that the VE setup seemed to perform the best. It was determined this seemed to be the case, as based on the gameplay, most of the single frames can extract the playstyle based at looking what the weapon the player is holding. And hence, based the VE is focused on frame by frame information, it's a more suitable method to extract this kind of information. We then moved on to look at our player movement based strategies. In this case, the playstyles are not actually encapsulated by the game variables and hence we see a significant drop in how well we cluster based on game variables. However, in clustering based on the encoding systems still perform reasonably well. However, when comparing it, the SCDIM performed better than BE. This seems to be the case, as in this set of playstyles, in order to determine what the playstyle is, we have to consider a sequence of frames, and the, the SCDIM compares more gets more high-level features which consider the whole sequence and hence performs well in this case. Ultimately it's thought that as both these encoding methods seem to encode well different types of playstyle, some sort of hybrid method can be bind to create an encoder that can understand a greater range of playstyles. In order to evaluate this, we then combined all the playstyles based both on gun choice and player movement and attempted to cluster based on this. First it should be noted that in this case game variables perform reasonably well, this is because it was found that it was clustering place purely on weapon choice, and as this is a partial description of the playstyles, we get reasonable results. However, it should be seen that the encoding systems always perform best, and in this case, the combination of the hybrid encoder with reference-based clustering performed the best out of everything. So overall, quick conclusion. The main other idea of this work was to allow us to cluster playstyles purely based on gameplay variables. It was noted and expected that when suitable variables could be selected and available, we could perform best when clustering on them but the methods suggested here are specifically for cases when this is not available or the type of playstyles are not known. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, please feel to drop by our Q&A session later. Have you ever sat in front of a Let's Play video, waiting for the action to finally kick off? Is it possible to find the most engaging part of such streams and jump to the best parts? To cleverly jump now to the meat of this presentation, Yes, it is. And here is how. Hi, my name is David from Model AI, and I'm here to tell you about our research in which we introduce a novel way to assess game engagements through the eyes of the observers, the live audience of streams. We use the chat log of streams to approximate the pull of a video, mapping gameplay events to chat frequency using a small neural network. Individual models reach up to 84% accuracy and generalize well across streamers with different playstyles with around 75 to 78 percent accuracy. In this study, we focus on Player Unknown Battlegrounds, or PUBG for short. It is the first flagship of the immensely popular Battle Royale genre, with millions of players playing and watching online. The game focuses on exploration and combat. On a large map, 100 players scramble to find the randomly scattered weapons and equipment to kill each other in a last man standing battle. Initially, the large map gives way to exploration with short bursts of action. However, as the game progresses, the safe, playable area shrinks, concentrating the players for a final showdown. PUBG was perfect for this experiment due to its popularity, gameplay dynamic, characterized by long periods of lull and publicly available API. Of course, the popularity of PUBG also owed to streaming. 
as millions of people tune in on platforms like Twitch to watch others play online. We chose to focus on Twitch as it is one of the most popular streaming services. Beyond connecting streamers and viewers, it also provides a social platform with a live chat application active during the streams. While studies have been done before on Twitch viewers, they were either focusing on static metrics per video, like chat message count, interaction count and number of viewers, or language processing applications which rely on content from the whole chat log. While these studies provide a lot of value, they also produce macro-level and often content-specific observations. In contrast, we model engagement continuously, allowing the highlighting of interesting parts within a video. When looking at how viewers interact with the streamer and each other, we can see how during action-packed sections of the game, chat messaging slows down as people concentrate on the game's content. Conversely, when the game slows down, messages flood in as viewers start to entertain themselves. To approximate this curve in the viewer engagement, we use the inverse chat frequency. This allows us to plot a continuous trace of engagement and we can reformulate the problem as binary classification. Our models derive high and low engagement labels using two parameters, the classification threshold and an uncertainty bound. For our study we chose five popular streamers because they had enough viewer count to reliably train our models. We extract 40 features from the detailed game logs of PUBG, focusing mainly on the streamer's data. The extracted features cover aspects of the streamer's health status, traversal, combat events, item usage, and the general state of the game. This gives us a large data set of 324 matches and around 120,000 data points. We employ neural networks which scale better compared to other methods used in effective computing such as support vector machines. We tune the models to find the best learning rate, number of hidden nodes and dropout rate, resulting in models which are small but efficient. As you will see, they will generalize well over an unseen population. Our results show that streamer-specific models are able to classify high and low momentary engagement with up to 80 to 84% accuracy on unseen matches. Of course, these models are very limited, as they were designed to only model a specific streamer. So our next step was to pool our data and train on multiple streamers while predicting the engagement of an unknown streamer's unseen matches. Using leave one streamer out cross-validation, our models reached an average accuracy of almost 75%, which already shows the generality of the method and the chosen metrics. But we can do one better. We returned to the game to look at how each streamer played and discovered three distinct play styles. To do this, we aggregated data points on the match level and applied k-means clustering to find distinct groups. We found that the data is best explained through three clusters which we named Noob, Explorer and Pro. Of course, these play styles varied within streamers across different matches, telling us more about the streamer's performance in a given match than the general play style. However, all in all, we could observe that in Noob matches, streamers died fast in the early sections of the game. During Explorer play style, they were focusing on salv uh, salvaging, traversal and positioning. And finally, when they were pros, they, they focused on combat efficiency. An interesting note is that playstyle doesn't correlate with popularity, as many popular streamers had a lot of noob matches. So with this knowledge, we returned to modeling by adding an extra step to our method. We first find a playstyle over a given match, then we train and employ a model specific to the given playstyle. This brings us closer to the performance of the individual models with over 77% average accuracy 
up to 84% in the best cases. However, so far we've only been focusing on making momentary predictions. As a final step, we integrated the prediction model into an online app which visualizes the predicted engagement generated by a stream. Engagement predictions are converted into a continuous engagement line by applying a moving average sampled at every second. This engagement line helps us to verify the usability of the model in the wild and showcases the industry application of machine learning models of engagement. As you can see in the video, the engagement line predictably follows an increasing heat of action. And then it decreases as the player wanders around, away from the heat of the combat. In this study, we looked at the data of only five streamers. However, since then we tested new unseen players and the results still hold with above 70% accuracy. The framework can also be extended in the future with natural language processing, facial emotion recognition and computer vision methods like pixel-to-engagement models as well. Our results show the robustness of using the inverse chat frequency as a measure of engagement of streamed games. While these results are supported by theory and can be verified empirically, the inverse chat frequency of viewers as a measure of engagement has to be cross-verified against annotation data from the viewers. Finally, we leave you with a link to our app so you can try it yourselves at streamer.model.ai. Thank you for listening and thanks for PUBG Corporation and Twitch.tv, with open APIs, made this project possible. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. It was really cool. Uh, I, my question is about the, the inverse frequency metric. It's very unintuitive, but it, it makes sense. Uh, I, what I was wondering is, uh, you, you list that the, the chat frequency tends to raise in periods of, of boredom. But I imagine it can also raise like as a direct right after a, a period of high tension, like by, because people are commenting, oh, look at that headshot or, oh, my God, he just died. And I was wondering if you observe this anecdotally in your data or if there is any way to distinguish between these high bursts of chat for boredom and for like game comments and following the release of the tension. Uh, yes, so it's, it, this, is, this is very true. So in, um, in Twitch chat and actually like all streaming applications, usually what we can observe is um, having like this cascade. So it's, it's a different type of uh, communication basically because yeah, everybody's cheering or having like emojis or GIF cascades over the chat when something big happens and having a more structured conversation than you know they're just bored and talking to the streamer or with each other um the current models don't uh look at this so it seems to us that at least in PUBG, which has like this very big like very short burst of action it was uh, it was enough to model it but as uh, we also said in the um, in the presentation in the future uh, natural language processing or um actually like any kind of processing just like looking at uh, the gif frequency or, like the emoji frequency in the messages can probably um incorporate this as well and increase the accuracy of the models thank you there's a question on the chat um is, uh, uh, the question is was the interaction between i guess you answered some of that was the interaction between the streamer and the audience or was maybe uh, the streamer's voice recording taken into account? Uh, no, not at this moment. So we just, uh, the actual uh, camera feed and the sounds are not uh, taken into account 
at all, actually. We only look at um, the game logs and uh, the chat frequency, nothing else. Uh, I have a question about the data set. So you, uh, when you have these different clusters, how uh, are these balanced? Like, do you have enough data for each one of these clusters or were there some clusters that are uh, more in the data? Um, I can you... take this one if you yeah. want. Yeah. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, so no, actually we found that uh, those three clusters, they have an balanced number of data points. In particular, we found that most of the matches were considered as no, and the least number of matches was considered as a pro, uh, which makes sense because most of the matches, like winning uh, a PUBG game is actually pretty hard, like, uh, because basically uh, all those matches that we consider uh, from the clustering point of view as pro matches were where the streamer was winning the match. So there is an imbalanced number of data points. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Let's see. There's another one on the chat, actually. Sorry, for, yeah. for, for interfering, ma'am. <laughs> no, that's fine. <laughs> Thank you. I, I didn't see that. Um, have you had a chance to show this uh, to streamers to see how this could be useful to them as a tool to guide this, their streams? Actually, I was thinking the same thing. Uh, not yet, but uh, we actually only debuted the system yesterday. So we are looking forward to getting some uh, feedback from streamers. Great. There is another one. I think this will probably be the last one so that we can move to the next talk. Uh, the clustering was broken into new Explorer Pro groups. Uh, would there be any benefit to try to model the style of play rather than uh, perceived skill? Um, players that uh, uh, prioritize uh, stealth versus aggressive play, given that the explorers um, seems to fit that paradigm. Uh, many, uh, many players can win PUBG without fighting until the closing mi minutes. Um, yeah, this is definitely true. But uh, so how we uh, derive the, the different groups, not necessarily tell uh, only about the per perceived skill. So what we did was um, collapse all each match into one data point, but we still had the 40 different features. So then the K-means clustering is over these 40 dimensions. So it takes into account all of these actually. Um, and basically the Nubex Explorer Pro grouping is just our own label after we looked closer to the da uh, at the data. So in a way it, it is already um, accounting for many of this. Of course, if we, if we put ourselves to, to clustering, again, we can, we can find ways that uh, may be more nuanced than K-means clustering. Yes, if I can add on that, basically the leveling was based on a bottom-up approach. So we look into the, uh, like to the, into the data points that were like clustered by the, by the three clusters with the K-means. Uh, we realized that one group was like an explorer group because most of the players were like, like uh, traveling a lot in that uh, cluster. And the pro one was uh, classified as pro because most of the matches were where the streamers were winning and so on and so forth. So, but this is like an interesting approach. I right? trying to have like a top down approach where we try to uh, identify different places that might actually help to get some interesting insight. Great, thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Thank you. So, uh, so next paper is actually, um, I'm gonna be presenting it, um, Data-Driven Game Development Ethical Considerations. Uh, so I'm gonna share the screens. Okay, so uh, so this was meant to be more of a position paper. Um, so I'm supposed, basically I wanted to have more discussion. So we'll see how that goes. Um, 
I can't see the all the screens because of everything else going on. So maybe um, if you have a question, just unmute and, and interrupt. Um, so uh, as we all know, and we were in the session for uh, game data, so there, there's been a lot of work with game data in both industry, academia, for many different reasons. Um, and we, when in 2013, we, we uh, interviewed many different companies to understand how they're using data in their pipeline. And I got asked the ethical question, how, how do you handle ethics? Um, and at that time, most people were thinking, how do we do this and how do we build models and what kind of models were we going to build and how is that going to help the development process and ethics kind of was on the side. Um, but now with um, ethics becoming a very important topic within AI, it started to appear again and I wanted to bring it to uh, the discussion uh, around game data. So people use game data for multiple reasons to tune and adapt the design, to assess maybe the workflow if you're getting data from the workflow process as well, um, for recommending items, for matchmaking, um, for player modeling. Uh, modeling in, in engagement, for example, and others. Um, also, companies use it for monetization. And for serious game <clears throat> type companies, you might have looking at um, learning or health. So there might be other uses as well. Um, ethics in AI has become a, a, a big topic. So there are multiple different books that start to appear on the topic. And, um, and some of the example books that I've read are Weapons of Math Destruction and Tools and Weapons. Um, and um, interestingly, also the media has started to discuss issues with, uh, for example, biased algorithms in, for racial equality in health and uh, the uh, a big example of um, uh, Google Photos being labeled, uh, labeling black people as gorillas uh, or labeling, uh, yeah. So, um, so there was a number of examples of these issues and um, at GDC, uh, Celia Hodent has started to discuss ethics, but mostly looking at uh, as aspects of uh, addiction, um, uh, not particularly how game data is being used. Um, Julian had a blog on how games will play you, you uh, discussing specifically how game data is being used and ethical considerations for that. Um, he and several collaborators also had a paper about um, ethic, ethical considerations specifically for player modeling. So um, we're basically expanding that discussion and, and um, in this particular paper and saying, well, it goes beyond just player modeling. There is other issues that we might want to look at how game, uh, how to um, um, address the ethical issues within. So when we're trying to measure engagement or measure retention and want to have players re uh, be uh, more engaged and, and retain them more uh, for many different reasons, maybe for uh, having them learn more within a learning game, for example, or have more health benefits in a health-based game. But does that uh, borderline on addiction. Um, that's a still a, a, a big question. Uh, monetization techniques um, maybe also encourage irresponsible spending in some cases. Um, in some, and when you're doing a lot of data modeling, and we've uh, see uh, uh, as you are using different data sets, you will know that some specific data sets might be uh, more, uh, you have more of the specific groups than others, maybe more newbies or more expert gamers, for example, in your data set than others. That lack of data for specific groups tend to marginalize these groups unfortunately. Uh, so this is another ethical issue. Um, there is also um, lack of models that capture individual differences because, again, this is variance. Um, and most statistical techniques will deal with variance differently. So you want to figure out how, how you would um, look at individual differences so you wouldn't treat them as error. Um, and uh, there's also a lot of uh, data that's being aggregated it from, from games rather than capturing the context. The context kind of gets thrown away uh, in some sense. And sometimes the context is uh, going to be very important for the modeling side. So, um, so this might be an issue uh, that might um, uh, cause some ethical issues as well for marginalizing specific groups. Um, there is also um, 
a lack of transparency and interpretability of the models uh, from an AI perspective as well. Uh, and that's been discussed in AI extensively. And that uh, come, kind of comes through to game data science as well. So in the paper, we didn't like, sometimes it's hard to focus on um, uh, uh, how to address specific issues, specifically retention and monetization, lack of data from specific groups are mostly not algorithmically, you can't really algorithmically address these in some sense. Um, you can maybe uh, address them through uh, policy or through uh, regulation in some, uh, in some form. So in the paper, we didn't really discuss how would we address that from a modeling perspective. Instead, we focused on the other three issues because these we can do something about in terms of the modeling and how the modeling choices that we discuss. So um, we discussed several ways that different researchers have um, addressed some of these issues like individual differences as ways to capture situation rather than uh, aggregate things, maybe looking at sequences of, um, of actions and retaining as much as possible in the, uh, for the context um, so that you can model using all of that data rather than aggregate and, and remove some of that detail. Um, some also researchers have tried to look at creating clusters of players um, uh, uh, through the interactions with designers rather than just uh, creating it from data. So you have a little bit more of a human in the loop uh, approach. Um, and uh, using visualization um, can help shed light on um, what kind of uh, aspects or features in the data you're using. And it can also embed the whole human in the loop to, uh, to start modeling things like individual differences, understanding your trends in the data and what groups are being marginalized in some form. Um, we have also been uh, looking at the human loop approach for more interactive machine learning so that we can um, diversify the, the bias. It doesn't mean that it's, a, a human is not going to come with their own bias. They will, uh, but um, uh, you're not going to have all the bias and the algorithms. You can negotiate the different biases that you're introducing into the system. So one way that we have been looking at it is to include the human in the uh, feature extraction process as well well as in the modeling process uh, through visualization interfaces. And this is just a, an example of how uh, we have been doing that. That was a paper that was uh, presented at uh, KaiPlay. So, um, so through the, uh, the talk, I basically wanted to, and this paper, as I said, is a position paper. So I wanted to bring up the issues and, and have a discussion about it and just uh, say this, this, is, this is how some people might um, be able to address some of these issues, but I wanted to now maybe open it up for more discussions and more questions and there may be more issues than what I, we've identified as well. I wanted to also note that um, um, one, uh, one of my um, PhD students, Erica, has been working with me on this, so she's here also to answer questions. I can just see her. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so we're, we're ready to answer any questions that you have. So there is one in the chat, uh, retention equal addiction. So are there metrics to distinguish? That's a good question. Um, 
I'm not sure if there is. This is why we were uh, saying that this particular one might be more of a um, uh, policy questions than than a, than actual algorithmic question. But maybe some other people have ideas of how to track these. Doing a position paper in Zoom is really hard. <laughs> okay, so I, yeah, there is one more from in the chat. Uh, what could be an alternative, alternative metric uh, for... Instead of retention, to maximize and try to increase as game designers. Yeah, maybe good. So it depends on the game, right? So if a game for learning, maybe it's more learning moments um, for engagement, maybe good moments. Um. Just uh, the comment there came from, um, you know, when you're keeping retention, the amount of time that is played is important. But if the amount of good moments the, the person experiences is that what stays with it, it doesn't have to be that long and maybe turn into addiction. That was the thought process there. Yeah. Yeah, I think this this is uh, this could be uh, great. I think the the issue from a game company perspective is sometimes time is important for a lot of other metrics like advertisements and and um, and money coming in. So uh, so yeah, I guess it depends on on the context. But yeah, if you are a designer and want to um, maximize something, maybe time in play might not be the right one. But then who knows? I mean, maybe good moments remembered also could cause more addiction. <laughs> it's not just time related. Do you think that policies would limit the innovation on the use of AI in games? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, depends on the policies i guess uh, there there has been already some uh policies about uh for for addiction specifically uh time of use um but that's more from a user perspective than, than a design perspective so um i think if anything i uh it might be a, a good discussion with policymakers um, to do this with game designers and game developers, which is what uh, Celia Hoden has been discussing at the GDC, is basically bringing the discussion together um, so it wouldn't have a limitation on innovation. Good question. So I think we're ready for the final talk. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Okay, so the final talk for this session is uh, uh, analysis of uh, business model transition uh, based on active user and review value. Uh, Muhammad, are you the one who's presenting this? Uh, yes. Okay, great. Okay. Uh... Okay, they just, uh, can you see the screen, like my slide screen? Okay. Yep. Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone or whatever time zone you are in right now. So uh, I'm going to uh, explain about my, our paper about analysis of business model transition based on user, active user and review value. Basically, we are discussing about two games that are uh, originally a pay to play games that transition into free to play games. And it's a project that we did together by me and my college, uh, Dr. Muhammad Akmal Halid, that will also answer the question with me in this uh, uh, Zoom meeting and also helped by my professor, Professor Hiroyuki Ida and Dr. Reza Firsandaya Malik. Okay, uh, so for the in introduction, I would like to introduce about the pay to play and free to play, but I believe that most of you might already know. So basically the difference between these two are like pay to 
play is the game that ask you to spend money before you play the game and the free to play that the one that makes you want to spend money before you uh, after you play the game and so this is like just simple introduction and like the comparison between the revenue of pay to play game and free to play games as you can see like the free to play game have more revenue than pay to play game even though you have to pay the game first and like basically the developer should get more money but yeah okay so uh so the games that we are analyzing here is the it's two games two popular games in steam counter strike global offensive and team fortress 2 so originally this game are released as pay to play games and then they transition into free to play games as yeah on the day that as written in this slide and we're going to use the uh, two data the active user data that collected from steam db and then it will be turned into daily active user and weekly active user and the second one is the user review data that collected from the steam web api and then we will turn it into a review ratio graph and then we will analyze the review text and and for for the uh, data stamp time stamp for the data it's uh, for the uh, each of the uh, business model type like p2p and f2p it's uh, the data contain about one year of uh, data for each game and for the review it's from the day of the game release until the day that we collected the data for like for the CSGO it's 21st November last year and for the TF2 it's 18 November last year. Okay, and for the DAU uh, as we can see that both game uh, gain, gain a lot of new players and uh, the average of like daily active user are increased as uh, statistically a significant increase and uh, the graph suggests that there are some change in the playing pattern of the players like there are there are a lot of increase in weekend uh, players online on weekends but there there's a bit of like decrease on the the weekdays like in this uh, peak daily active users there are like slight decrease on the weekdays for CSGO and for the weekly active user uh, we try to compare this with the the this F2P transition with uh, major updates in the games so uh both yeah as we can as we know that both game gain a lot of new players but this doesn't stay long and it's like after they reach some certain amount of peak they will like de decaying and then stabilize uh, after a few weeks and if you compare the impact between major updates and the the free to play transition that free to play transition have bigger impact than the uh then the major updates and this is actually what we want to know whether this uh, free to play transition is a viable option to uh, save the game from being like dead or survive uh, uh gaining a lot of uh, try to like survive i uh, don't know revive the game sorry and from from the review graph uh, for the CSGO, uh, we saw a lot of like uh, negative review increase on on the day after uh, free to play transition, but we didn't see any in the TF2. Uh, I check on the re reviews on the TF2. I think uh, most on uh, no, all of them are uh, positive. This uh, this might happen because uh, the TF2 has transitioned into free to play long before uh, CSGO and it's been like seven years, no, eight years before we collected the data. So the user might already change their mind because they can change the negative to positive in their uh, Steam review. But from here, uh, we can see that there's massive 
uh, increase in negative review, but we don't know what exactly happened. So that leads to the next analysis that we try to analyze the user review text. We extracted the keywords in the negative review by using rake, the rapid automatic keyword extraction. And uh, yeah, we only extract keywords from English uh, reviews and we try to filter out the reviews that are less than five words that because we thought uh, we think that this review are just spam or have no meaning. So we try to like filter out this review. And uh, these are, uh, we try to compare the negative review keywords during the P2P uh, times and also F2P times. So we found out that there are the, uh, there are some, some same keywords like a get banned, ranking system, many hackers, many cheaters, or toxic community that we believe this is uh, the problems that CS, oh yeah, by the way, uh, this is the review for CSGO because we didn't find any negative review, uh, any negative in review increase in TF2. So this analysis is only for CSGO. Sorry for mentioning it late. So we believe that these are the problems that CSGO already have before they transition, but they uh, failed to, they failed to fix this before they transition into free to play because uh, basically during free to play, we you will let a lot of players come without uh, uh, paying any cost to enter your game. So as if we see, uh, if we see it as a perspective of players, like we, if you want to hack in the play as a hackers in the game, so you can just play the game and then hack, and then if it's get banned, you can just create a new account. You don't have anything to lose compared to the P2P times. And then we found we found new keywords like Battle Royale and Danger Zone Trust Factor. These are the up, new updates that Cisco tried to bring during the free to play, but it kind of get negative uh, reviews or uh, the players see this as uh, uh, or the player are not they, the player are not satisfied with these updates that the CSGO bring, especially this uh, keywords that money back. I think these keywords are mostly from the existing players during free uh, P two P that they feel may, they maybe feel unsatisfied with the uh, compensation or the things that differentiate them from the P2P players and free-to-play players. And also, yeah, new players. It's, yeah, I want to mention it, this about the new players coming in, but I can already mention it before, so I'm sorry. Uh, so this is just a visualization from the negative review. So the existing player feel upset or not satisfied with the updates, so that's why they kind of like bomb the review to get attention from the developers. Uh, so the limitation limited limitation of this uh, project is that we only uh, see this in perspective of uh, active user players and reviews, but we, did, uh, we cannot judge whether the developer itself gaining a lot of money. And also, we did not consider the difference between time on 2011 and 2018 that uh, the numbers of free games in 2011 and 2018 are kind of like different and the numbers of players are also different. So that make, might be difference in terms of reception of free games as we can see in this data. And for the future work that we, if we are, if we have like access to the data, it might be good to get some analysis in terms of the financial aspect of the games, and it can be it 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 can be also useful to think that whether this uh, 
P2P transition into F2P is a good strategy to uh, revive the game. For example, like uh, games that are not really popular anymore, like PUBG, it was very popular on 2018 and 19 because yeah, everyone plays it. And but nowadays they are not really popular anymore. So for the conclusion, uh, the effect of F2P transition. So both game definitely gain new players, and the change there might be change and players playing pattern, and also it this F2P transition might put the game in critical position or got review bombed. And if we also uh, look closer into the user review, we can actually see what are the things that become that will be a problem in. F2, if we want to tra uh, transition into F2P. So it might be good to consider that we need to fix this kind of problem before transitioning into F2P for the other game developers who want to do this uh, transition. Yep, I think uh, that's all for my presentation. If you have any question, please, or suggestion, it will be appreciated. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, we have time for questions. Uh, you don't I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Um, yeah, thanks for the great talk. Um, I'd have a, questions, a question or a proposition. <laughs> um, however you wish to take it. Um, bo both the games you've referenced are um, fairly similar in so far that they are um, Two teams that compete against other teams, and um, I believe one of the games that transitioned fairly recently to free-to-play is Destiny 2, which would be an entirely different thing where you cooperate with other players to um, usually fight um, some kind of uh, some kind of AI creatures. And um, I, I guess that you would have very very different problems there with what people could complain about. Um, besides just the transition, but the, um, let's say, fine-tuning of how it was handled, not because only the, uh, the problems persist, but because you have to somehow make it approachable for um, people who join the game and people who had not only practice, but who have now um, gear or progress that others may not have and how that is handled. I just wanted to um, kind of throw it out there and um wonder whether you could apply a, a similar kind of approach to think about these more may maybe more complicated situations i think that would be a good idea to also analyze from the perspective of that gameplay like you mentioned the gameplay change in destiny 2 yeah uh, i think it will be a good idea to um analyze on that yeah, not only the gameplay change, but in, um, in, in Team Fortress or in CSGO, as far as I am aware, the progress doesn't change your equipment, for example, much beyond the cosmetic. You are still mm -hmm. able to compete as a new player. You just lack the experience or you lack the skill or you lack the coordination in a team or you may just lack a team. While in um, Destiny, you need to grind to a certain extent. You need to progress in some kind of press story you need to acquire new equipment so the gap between new player and experienced players or just uh, players who have been there for a long time becomes not only one of skill but one of progress within some kind of progress system that is dependent on what the game offers and closing that without um, either dealing some damage to what is potentially dozens or um, hundreds of hours of progress on the more experienced players part, not only once again in terms of skill, but in terms of the content they have access to or um, the, um, the, the gear they have. I, I, I think that would be pretty diff uh, difficult to balance and um, that people would have a little bit more <laughs> nuanced complaints maybe, even, not, uh, even if not less forceful. Okay. Um, I think we're uh, about to close actually so that we can start the other session. Um, so I don't know if you wanted to 
uh, comment on that or mm. if not well, we can yeah. just mm. we can thank the speaker and and I think we we're just closing the session and we have one minute to start the next uh, session. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs>